Hi, welcome to our second annual commemoration of the Feast of Passover. My name is Pastor Ken Baer. I'm with Faith Dialogue, and I just wanted to be able to welcome you into this celebration today. And what we're going to do today is what's called What's a Seder? Just a small demonstration for you to try to understand this 3,000 year old festival. Passover is the oldest and most important of all the Jewish religious festivities. Um, commemorating God's deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt, it is based on the Feast of Passover, primarily from Exodus chapters 12 through 14, in which the Israelites celebrated their deliverance by God from slavery in Egypt. So, so what's a Christian Seder? Well, at the very beginning, we acknowledge that Jesus was Jewish. He has said he celebrated the Passover. In the Gospel of Luke, for example, it says this, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. The Last Supper, when Jesus ate with his disciples, was a Passover meal. At that time, many elements of the ritual of the Passover meal had already pointed to the sacrifice that would be made by the expected Messiah, who would rescue Israel not from slavery in Egypt, but from slavery to sin. Jesus was the Messiah of Israel, and Jesus is the Savior of all who believe in him. So we all celebrate the, the Passover. Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, barbarians, slave, free, male and female, we all celebrate. We're all children of Abraham by faith. All of the biblical fe feasts are rich in meaning and point ultimately to the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. From the time of Moses, Jews have celebrated the Passover. The celebration is called the Seder, which actually means order. Um, there is a set order of service that has included the very essential elements prescribed in the book of Exodus for over 3,000 years. So more and more Christians are embracing their Jewish roots and taking a look at the feasts of Israel. We're actually following the leadership of organizations like Chosen People Ministries and Jews for Jesus that have promoted Christian Passover services as a means for Jews to retain their cultural heritage while at the same time embracing Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They've also used the Christian Passover as a means to communicate to others the Jewish religious heritage that we all share. So let's talk a little bit about what the Passover is. Passover has been observed by the Jewish people over three millennia. The term Passover actually refers to the tenth and the final plague that God brought upon the Egyptians to persuade Pharaoh to let his people go. As you recall, the Jewish people were in bondage in Egypt. They had lived in an area called Goshen since the time of Joseph. However, for hundreds of years, they had been subjected to cruel slavery. And the Bible tells us that God raised up Moses to be able to deliver the people. It was Moses that went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. However, Pharaoh was very stubborn and he wouldn't let the people of Israel go. So God used 10 plagues in order to get Pharaoh's attention. But Pharaoh was stubborn, but God is very, very persuasive with these plagues. The 10 plagues um, allowed uh, Pharaoh's heart um, even though it was hardened every time to understand exactly what God was doing for the people of Israel and trying to deliver them. This tenth plague, however, was the, the, the worst of all. It was the death of all of the firstborn. You know, in the previous nine plagues, the people of Israel living in the land of Goshen were exempt from the plagues. Did you realize that? For example, there were the swarms of flies in Exodus 8, and it says, In that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of fly will be there. So they were exempt. Um, later, in Exodus, um, Exodus 10, when the Lord brought darkness, uh, the Bible says no one could see anyone else or move about for three days, yet all of the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. This last plague, however, was different. This is, what the plague of the, this is the plague of the death of the firstborn, and this is what we read about in Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, as well as 11 through 15. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. 
and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all of the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Now verse 11. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of, every, of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generation to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So this is an historical beginning of the Passover, what I just read. As it was to be a lasting ordinance, it would ultimately be then celebrated by the Jews living in Jerusalem, in Israel, at the time of Jesus. Jesus and his disciples all celebrated the Passover in what we now know as the Last Supper. In the Gospel of Luke, verse 8, it says, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now, in obedience to God's instructions, Moses instructed all of the Jewish families to place the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes so that the angel of God would pass over their homes. So we see here, even before the 10th plague had begun, that the people of Israel were instructed to do something particularly meaningful. They were instructed to take the blood of the lamb, take a reed, dip it on the blood, and place it at the top of the door and then on each side. So it would be like this, on the top of the door and then on each side. The blood would mark the door so that they would be delivered. Death would not come that night. The mark on the door would be in the sign of a cross, signifying that Jesus would be nailed to a cross made of wood, just like the wood on the door. His arms would be stretched out, and he would be called the Lamb of God. Note also, all, not just a few, all of the people of Israel that applied the blood to their homes would be delivered. Now, they'd all be saved, but were all these Jews good Jews? Were some of them bad? Well, see, here's the point. Regardless of whether they're good or bad, that made no difference. What they did wasn't what was saving them. It was the blood that was a being applied on their behalf. So this is a cause for celebration. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, it says this, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, man from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So let's now turn our attention to the Seder itself. The contemporary Passover meal is known as the Seder, which means order, because the meal and service is done in a prescribed sequence. Now, the, the other word you hear is the Haggadah, and the Haggadah means the telling, which outlines the steps of the meal as well as the readings and songs of the participants. Typically, a booklet, like this one, is given to all of the participants, so all of them have the prayers both in English as well as Hebrew, and a lot of the story is already in the booklet. The Seder and the Haggadah appeals to all of the senses and involves everyone in the family, both young and old, all learn the Word of God. As such, the Passover has been, has been termed one of the most effective teaching tools ever designed. As the Passover requires preparation, one of the rituals that has survived and actually taken on new meanings in both Jewish as well as Christian homes is the removal of the kamets. In this video, we see a young couple, uh, Piera and Josh, so they have show how they've turned this ancient tradition into a fun scavenger hunt for their young child. The book of Exodus said that all leaven must be removed from the household. This removal of the leaven is actually part of what is known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread that culminates with the Passover. 
you'll see that the boy is holding a lit candle. Typically, families will use both a candle, which is even more fun when the lights are off, and a soft broom, maybe a feather, and they collect the bits of leaven into a spoon and they put them into a bag. In the days preceding the Passover, it's tradition to clean the house thoroughly. And the evening before the Passover Seder, any trace of kemets is removed from the house. Leaven or yeast is a necessary element in baking and winemaking. It's just not, it's not just bread. Leaven is also in cookies and crackers, cereals, pancakes, and donuts, for example. In the evening before the Passover, many families make a formal search of the house and all of the surrounding properties. It's customary to put a few pieces of hard bread in various places sometime before the search, so that the one who searches will find them easily. According to some traditions, there should be 10 pieces. However, I'm not really sure where the 10 symbolizes or where that tradition really started. Before starting the search, the following blessing is recited. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the removal of the Kemets. Prior to the beginning of this Find the Leaven event, somebody in the family would hide several pieces of regular raised bread in fairly obvious places around the room. My son-in-law, who grew up celebrating the Passover, said in his home as a little child, he would use the candle just like this little boy. He said they were disappointed one year when the rabbi suggested using modern flashlights to avoid burning down the house. If you notice, anything that is found is put into a paper bag. Traditionally, the bag and all of its contents is then burned in the fire, a fitting end to that which represents both sin and has the power to decay and destroy. In the second part of the video, we meet Rachel, a Christian woman who has embraced both the Christian Seder in all of its history and significance, as well as adopting her own removal of the Kamets tradition. What Rachel has done is she has taken the opportunity on the night or possibly day before Passover to so thoroughly clean out seven different areas. I think we'll see her spend some time in the refrigerator, the freezer, the oven, broiler, kitchen cupboards, under the rugs, etc. In fact, it's possible that this removal of the Kamets the day before Passover has led to the tradition that we call spring cleaning here in the United States. All through the removal process, the participants experience the deeper significance of Passover. The removal of leaven signifies the attitude of penitence, the willingness to remove any corrupting influence in one's life and submit to God in obedience. As the Israelites prepared for the exclusive for Exodus by obeying the commandments of God through Moses, so in removing the leaven or kamets, we symbolize our willingness to obey God in preparation for celebrating the deliverance he has already brought on his people. So this was a fun video. Our thanks to Pet Pietra and Josh and their son, as well as Rachel, for show sharing their tradition with us. Now, the removal of leaven is something that the Apostle Paul had something to say about. In fact, the context that Paul uses is the Passover exactly. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as, we, as Paul points out, leaven is actually a symbol for sin. And after all the leaven is removed, we can finally begin the Seder. In Judaism, Passover is not a public service or worship, but it's celebrated as a family meal. Families get together, extended families, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa get together around a table and they celebrate this telling of the Passover story. Now what I find interesting in the Bible is it says that the Passover lamb is required to be eaten in one sitting at one time and you need to eat the entire lamb. Well when you think about it, Jesus and 12 hungry apostles just about fits the bill. Passover officially begins with the lighting of the Passover candle. Here we see this in this brief video. The mother of the home lights the candles. The candles symbolize the presence of God and mark this as a sacred time. Here we see the lighting of the candles. Typically, someone will read from the Haggadah. After lighting the candles, she waves her hands over the candles three times as if welcoming in the holiday. 
She then covers her eyes with her hands or a prayer scarf and prays typically in Hebrew but also in English. And this is what she would say. Blessed art you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and has brought us to this special time. So Passover can now begin. And like any other, any other good meal, it begins with wine. We'll see that in the Seder celebration, there are four cups that are taken. This is all taken from Exodus, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. God said through Moses, listen, now listen for the four promises of God. He says, I am the Lord your God, and I will bring you out of the, from the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and then I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am your Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So these four cups of wine, representing four promises made to Israel, typically only the leader, the father of the family that serves as priest, has four cups in front of him. As as for the rest of us, it's the same cup, but has four different names for each time it's used to drink. The first cup of wine is called the cup of sanctification. It is a to commemorate the first promise, I will bring you out. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. It reflects the plagues that came upon Egypt, and it relates to the second promise, I will free you from being slaves. We're unsure of exactly when the present Seder tradition regarding the second cup began. There's no mention of the, in the New Testament of the second cup at the Last Supper, but it's a wonderful tradition at the Seder. The people of Israel celebrating the Seder don't drink from the second cup, but with a finger, they remove a drop of wine from the cup and wipe it on the plate. As each plague is mentioned, all of the people say aloud all of the four plagues, blood, frogs, lice, wild beasts, blight, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the slaying of the firstborn. The third cup is called the cup of redemption, and it's, it is taken after the meal. God says, I will redeem you. At the Last Supper, the Last, the last Supper, Jesus likely drank from the first and the second cups, but when he reached the moment to drink from the third cup of wine called the cup of redemption, he paused and he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples. The Gospel of Matthew records this. He says, then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of this vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We notice that Jesus associated the wine of the third cup with his spilled blood on the cross. Jesus shared that cup with his disciples just as we share it with the congregation when we celebrate a communion service. Following the third cup is the fourth cup. It's called the cup of completion. God says, I will take you as my own people. Jesus stated that he would not drink from this fourth cup, and the fact that the gospel account shows that they sang a hymn and then departed and went out to Gethsemane without ever touching the fourth cup. The Last Supper, that final Passover meal, was suspended at the point of drinking the third cup. The fourth cup will not be consumed until the inauguration of the kingdom of God. In Revelation 11:15, we see the fourth cup and the inauguration of the kingdom. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Sometime in the past, a fifth cup, not just the four, but a fifth cup was added to the Seder plate. I don't have it represented here today, but let me tell you a little bit about it. It's called the cup of Elijah that's filled during the final stage of the Seder. But this cup of wine is, is never drunk. Instead, it's placed at the center of the table. Tradition has taught that in the last day, the Messiah will come from the east. Therefore, it's natural to assume that Elijah will also come from the east. 
in a good Jewish home, the doors facing the east will be opened. The children will run out by the door to see if Elijah is coming. Um, when the door is then closed and all are back seated at the table, the, ch the children hurriedly move towards the table to see if Elijah had come and disturbed the cup at all. Maybe took a couple sips while nobody was looking. Now we'll turn our attention to the Seder plate. I'm going to take you around the plate with an explanation of each one of the items. Now other than the wine, the Seder plate is the focal point of the entire Seder event. Whether it's an ornate silver dish, a disposable paper plate like the one that I'm using, or a humble napkin, it bears the ceremonial foods around which the Seder is based. Bitter herbs, parsley, lettuce, a roasted egg, shank bone, Sharoset, haroset. And the seventh item, typically placed off on the plate on a folded napkin, is the unleavened bread, the matzah. Now let's start actually with the matzah. Three matzahs are placed on top of each other on a plate or napkin and then covered. We have three matzahs here so that we can break one and still have two whole matzahs left over which to recite the bread blessing and that bread blessing, by the way, is also said at every Shabbat. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now we're going to return to the matzah again after we talk about the Seder plate for a very special reason. Now let's begin with the plate. Numbers 1 and 3, the bitter herbs, typically horseradish and lettuce. The bitter herbs remind us of the bitterness of the slavery of our forefathers in Egypt. Fresh grated horseradish and romaine lettuce are the most common choices. We'll be using another item on the plate, the lettuce with the bitter herbs. While romaine lettuce is not bitter, the stems are bitter and bitter is actually better. So we'll partake of the bitter herbs by first praying a prayer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has commanded us regarding the eating of these bitter herbs. Once the prayer is given, the leader and all of the participants eat the bitter herbs. Second, the parsley. The leader would take a sprig of the fresh parsley and holds it up for all the people to see. This parsley represents life created and sustained by the Lord our God. We are filled with joy at the goodness of God in loving us and caring for us and bringing into our lives all good things. And then the leader would take the parsley and lift up the bowl of salt water with it so that everybody can see. Tonight we're celebrating this freedom and wonderful deliverance that God brought us out of slaves of Egypt is what he would say. But we do not forget that life in Egypt was hard and filled with pain and suffering and tears. Let us never forget that the struggle for freedom begins in suffering and that life is sometimes immersed in tears. And that's exactly what the salt water represents. The salt water represents the tears of the people of Israel. We therefore dip the spring of parsley into the salt water. Now the next two items were not part of the original Passover that Jesus celebrated and you'll see exactly why as we get into them. Number four, the hard-boiled or ro roasted egg. Now, the leader would typically take the roasted egg from the Seder plate and would hold it up for everybody to see. History tells us that this roasted egg was not introduced in the Passover celebration until after the temple had been destroyed in 70 AD, so it would not have been part of the Passover of Jesus that we know commonly as the Last Supper. The egg is typically brown on the outside because it's been roasted and because sacrifices, as they're consumed by the fire, turn brown. It's a memorial because the temple has now been destroyed. Jesus had prophesied the temple would be destroyed in Mark 13. It says, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his followers said to him, Look, teacher, how beautiful the buildings are, how big the stones are. Jesus said, Do you see all these things? All these buildings, not one stone will be left on another. Every stone will be thrown down to the ground. Now, the egg is a symbol, actually, of mourning. And it's to remind us that the temple in Jerusalem, the place of sacrifices, is no longer standing. And so sacrifices are no longer offered. But since it has no beginning or no end, the egg also is a symbol of a new living hope. 
And it reminds us that God's grace is not confined to the sacrifices in a temple. There are many, many different customs regarding this egg. Some leave it whole and just remove it after the Haggadah. Some will eat the egg during the Haggadah and the, with salt water which has been set on the table. Often the egg will be halved, making it a little easier to eat. Now, item number five, the shank bone. As I said again, this is an item that was, has been added to the Seder plate and for very good reason. It goes back to the same explanation given just before regarding the brown uh, roasted egg. As there is no longer a temple and no priest, there are no lambs that can be sacrificed for Passover. The rabbis have determined that lamb can't even be part of the Passover meal. As a result, many of our Jewish friends have chicken or some other dish, but never lamb. The shank bone represents that the lamb that had always been part of the Passover celebration. Jesus would have shared a full roasted lamb with his disciples that would have been presented and sacrificed at the Jewish temple. The last one, haroset. Haroset, you have to have that H, haroset. Haroset is a sweet, dark colored paste made of fruits and nuts and eaten at the Passover Seder. Its color and texture are meant to recall mortar or mud that was used um, to make adobe bricks, which the Israelites used when they were enslaved in ancient Egypt. Haroset is one of the symbolic foods on the Passover plate and one of the more pleasant tasting elements. In most Jewish communities, haroset is reserved as an accompaniment for the bitter herbs. When you eat a bit of the horseradish or even the parsley with the salt water, a small dollop of haroset is like honey. It makes the venison go down. Many families make haroset sandwiches with haroset between two pieces of matzah. Next, let's look at the matzah. Remember I said before that I was going to go back to the matzah because there's some very symbolic meanings in the matzah itself. So we're all familiar with matzah. Uh, we recall it as an unleavened bread at our communion services. And we remember Jesus taking the matzah into his hands and, what it, and, this, and it's recorded in Luke, the 22nd, 22nd chapter, exactly what Jesus said. He said, this is my body which has been given for you. In the Seder, at the beginning of the service, there are three matzahs in front of the leader. Well, the question is, why three? Now, some rabbis will say that the three matzahs represent the three people at the celebrations. The, the, um, the people, the Levites, and the priests. Other rabbis will say, no, the three matzahs actually represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but you're already getting ahead of me probably. We're looking as a believer in Jesus Christ and we see the three matzahs and we say, I think I know what that means. We have good reason to believe that the three matzahs represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now remember, this idea of a trinity was a mystery until we, in the Old Covenant, it was a mystery completely, even though going all the way back to Genesis, we see God saying these words, let us, make man in our own image, this plurality of God. So we, we have good reasons to believe that the rabbis don't have it right with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Levites, the people, and the priests, that it's most likely the Trinity for a couple of good reasons. If it was representing the priests, Levites, and the people, why would the middle one be taken out and broken? Same, same question if the, three if the three matzahs represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, why take the middle one out? However, notice the appearance of the matzah. It's easy to see what looks like bruises and stripes and that it's pierced. Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah 700 years before Christ came. And this is what he said. He said, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's Isaiah 53, 5. So now we can see why the middle matzah is taken out and it's broken during this Passover Seder. Now, the thing is, is that there's, there's more to it. There's more to it. The, this, this middle matzah is actually taken out and it's put into another container, another linen bag uh, called the afikoman. And the afikoman is then hidden 
Um, in the Seder celebration, this middle piece of matzah that we, rep that we believe represents Jesus Christ is taken, it's wrapped in a linen, as I mentioned, and uh, this afikoman is a word that means he who comes after. Isn't that interesting? The rabbis determined that the afikoman actually means it's dessert. What comes after the meal? It's dessert. Well, that might be true, but we actually know of the person that came after and that will actually come again. Traditionally, after the afikoman is broken, it's hidden. Depending on the family and their particular customs, either the leader hides the afikoman during the meal and the children at the table then have to go find it, or the children at the table actually steal the afikoman and take it away. Either way, the Seder cannot be concluded until the afikoman is found and brought back back to the table. It's then shared among all the people. A little piece of the matzah is broken off and it's shared among all the people. Very similar to our present day communion service. Now when the children bring it back they usually receive a gift of some kind. Uh, usually some candy, money, or maybe some small small trinket of some kind. Historians tell us that this practice of hiding the afikoman was instituted during the Middle Ages by Jewish families in Europe to make the Seder more entertaining and exciting for their children. But oh my goodness, it's, it's just so full of, of symbolism for us. For the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian community as well, the symbolism of the Afikoman was obvious, symbolically representing the Messiah as Jesus, uh, as his body was given to us. It was wrapped in linen, placed in a tomb, and then on the third day, he rose again. Although the afikoman provides a remarkable symbol of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, many Jewish people have not yet discovered their Messiah. The Messiah thus remains hidden from much of the Jewish community, just like the afikoman. But not for all of the Jewish community, and as there has been hundreds of thousands of Jewish people that have actually found their Messiah. I mentioned to you earlier one of the organization's Chosen People Ministries. Let me introduce you to a friend of mine, Israel Cohen, and he'll tell you a little bit about his story. I mean, I heard about some of these, these guys like John the Baptist. He's a Baptist. I found out later on he's Jewish. St. Paul, Jewish? Yeah, Jewish. St. Peter, how can anybody by the name of St. Peter be Jewish? Guess what? I found out they're all Jewish. Now, I grew up in Philadelphia in a Jewish neighborhood. On the other side of the street, that was mostly Gentiles. These poor Gentiles, they would worship a statue. Some of those people had statues in their lawns. At the age of eight years old, I joined the Cub Scouts, which is part of the Boy Scouts. They had a, they have, they still probably have this today, a, a magazine. It's called Boy's Life Magazine. And in that magazine, they had the instructions on how to build a uh, crystal radio. I was so excited. It was, it was like I was in heaven with this radio that worked. I would rush home from school and put on the earphones. And I was hearing these people talking about Jesus on the short wave, they were like, in the name of Jesus. At the same time, I was preparing for my bar mitzvah, and my rabbi told me, never believe in Jesus, and never read the New Testament. That's a Gentile book, and Jesus is for the Gentiles. I joined the Navy in 1960 and wound up in a, in a drill hall with 400 guys. Now, this is the first time in my life I was ever away from my mother and father. They taught me how to smoke a cigarette. Uh, you know, oh, I was coughing like crazy. They said, real sailors drink whiskey. And that was burning my throat. I did it because I wanted to be a real sailor. I wound up getting drunk every night. Wound up going out with, with women that I shouldn't be doing. Sometimes deep down inside of me, I was saying, man, this doesn't feel right. Something's wrong here. This doesn't seem right. You see, when you join the Navy, I don't know if they do this today anymore, but this was back in 1960. We were naked, not our hair shaved, and then we went through the line to get our uniforms and stuff. At the end of the line, they said Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. So they gave you a Bible. I had my Tanakh. I had my little, my Jewish scriptures. And I don't know what you do with the Bible. I thought, you know, it might be like a rabbit's foot, good luck charm, or maybe it'd be like my grandmother's chicken soup. Anytime I was sick, my grandmother said, have some matzo ball soup, have some chicken soup. It'll, I said, will it help? She said, it couldn't hide, you know? I said, well, I have a Bible. Will it help? Well, it couldn't hide, you know? Uh, one of the sailors uh, that I was with in the Navy said to me, you're Jewish, right? I said, yeah. Do you have a Bible? I said, sure, I have a Bible. They gave it to me when I joined the Navy. He said, let me see your Bible. 
and he turned in my Bible to Isaiah chapter 53. He said, here, read this. I read the whole chapter of Isaiah 53. I said, wait a minute. This sounds like those folks across the street. This sounds like the Gentiles. This sounds like what I was hearing on the short wave. They made a mistake. They gave me New Testament. And my rabbi told me, never read the New Testament. You better take this because this is for you. This is not my Bible. So no, no, look, Hebrew Publishing Company. <gasps> Hebrew Publishing Company. What's, this is crazy. What's Jesus doing in my Bible? He said, well, he's your Messiah. He's my Messiah. I, I, I was shocked. And he said, would you like to read about that in the New Testament? I said, uh, well, I can't read the New Testament because my rabbi told me never read uh, the New Testament. And he looked around over here. I looked over here. And he says, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't tell your rabbi that you read the New Testament, I won't tell him either. I thought about that for a minute. Okay, but I was scared. I thought lightning was going to strike me. I actually thought I was going to be struck by lightning. I expected it to be a Gentile book. I expected it to take place in Rome with a bunch of popes talking about Catholic things and statues. What surprised me is how Jewish the New Testament really is. It's the most Jewish book I ever read. The more I, I, I read the scriptures, the more I, I was, was praying, I realized that inside I was not, not clean. Inside, I had all kinds of anger. I was getting drunk every night. I was going with the women. I was smoking three packs of unfiltered palm all day, coughing like crazy. I was making pretend like I enjoyed it. I didn't want to make pretend anymore. I didn't want to live that way anymore. Now it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm in the barracks, big barracks. And I had a blanket all the way over, and, and the light was shining on the New Testament. And I, I prayed, you know, Baruch Atah, and no, Elohim, Amalek, Elohim. Lord, uh, uh, Jesus, I'm here. Uh, um, I want to believe in you. And I went to bed. May 16th, 1961, came to faith in, in the Messiah. That's just so important in my life. It's, it's a, 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 a moment that totally, completely changed and revolutionized my life. Even if I was the very last person on earth, Jesus would still have died for me. And I am confident that when I die, I'll go to be with him. Every Passover Seder concludes with these words, next year in Jerusalem, the candles are extinguished, the people are dismissed. We hope that you've enjoyed this brief presentation of what a Seder would be like. That's why we call it, What's a Seder? We hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, we'd love it for you to con contact us. If you'd like to be able to get a, a script, a transcript of, of what we just went through with all of the elements of the Seder, or if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at, at faithdialogue.org. We pray that you may know Jesus as the Messiah and celebrate his second coming. God bless.